In this video, we're looking at an important but uh, tricky section to get our heads around. We are on this journey with Mr. Teacher through this book of Ecclesiastes where he's often said meaningless, everything is meaningless. And we need to get our heads around this section. Uh, the sermon I preached from this section I called, If Only Life Was Less Enigmatic. If you are new to this channel, I encourage you to subscribe, like this video, share it with others who you think might find this useful. And as I always do in these videos, I'm going to highlight some of what I've seen in the text. But before that, if you haven't yet read through this section, I encourage you to take some time to do that, to read and reread. It's one of the most important tools in getting your head around the text. But more important than that is take some time to pray that God would open your eyes to understand his word so that uh, you might be challenged and changed by it. Now, Mr. Teacher starts this section with uh, this word again, uh, the Hebrew word Havel, in this meaningless life of mine. Uh, as we've seen in some of these videos, uh, a better translation would be enigmatic. Life is enigmatic. It's difficult to grab hold of and to make sense of. And that's something that we're going to see in a big way in this section. Just as we look at structure, so verse 15 here sets up the exasperating, enigmatic nature of life under the sun, the thing that's really frustrating him. Uh, verses 16 to 18, uh, he poses a couple of uh, statements in response to this. Now, in many ways, this statement in verse 16 is fleshed out here in verses 19 to 24. And this statement in verse 17 is then fleshed out in verses 25 through to 28. And then at the end, we get this uh, final discovery where he says, uh, this only have I found. So the structure, the opening uh, enigmatic nature of life that he looks at, uh, he then poses some thoughts which he fleshes out in verses uh, 19 to 24 of fleshing out verse 16, verse 25 to 28 of fleshing out verse 17. And verse 18 here is an important verse in the section. It's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And uh, that's something that we've already seen in the book of Ecclesiastes uh, back in chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, we were told to fear God, and God is mentioned a few times in this section. Now, in this section, uh, Mr. Teacher contrasts uh, the righteous and the wicked. He says here in verse 16, do not be over-righteous or over-wise, do not be over wicked and then he talks about uh, not uh, avoiding all extremes and we've got to get our heads around exactly what he's talking about here um, because we are actually called to be people who are increasingly righteous uh, particularly as we have been made righteous in Christ we're meant to live and increasingly look like Christ as he does a work in us and transforms us so We've got to get our heads around exactly what Mr. Teacher is talking about when he says don't be over-righteous. But before we have a look at that, we'll also just see some repetition of uh, wisdom or those who are wise. But also we see that wisdom is contrasted with uh, folly and not being a fool or stupidity. And we also see this repetition of uh, he's trying to search out wisdom and the scheme of things. He's trying to discover the scheme of things. Then he realizes that humanity have gone in search of many schemes. The teacher here is the one who is on this journey of discovery. And he's helping us to see what he has discovered and what he hasn't discovered. As we've seen in Ecclesiastes, he also speaks about our heart. Yeah, don't take to heart or I do not pay attention. It's actually uh, don't take to heart every word that people say. Uh, he turns his heart to understand. We also need to understand what he's talking about with this woman who is a snare. 
and he hasn't found one upright woman. So a whole lot going on in this passage that we need to get our heads around. Uh, but to start with, to try and understand what he's saying, do not be over-righteous, uh, do not be over-wicked. Uh, I think to really understand this, we need to understand what he gets to at the end here, where he says, this is the big thing that he's found. In all of his searching, he, he hasn't been able to discover a whole lot of things, but he has found this. God created mankind upright, but mankind have gone in search of many schemes. And this is where the problem comes in. The problem is not with God. God made us good. Just go read Genesis 1 and 2. By the end of creating mankind, he says, and it was very good. But Genesis 3, Adam and Eve go in search of many schemes and the rest is history. The tragic history of our world that has gone in search of wicked schemes, walking away from the God who made them. And that is the reason why uh, righteous people perish in their righteousness and wicked people live long in their wickedness. That's the reason for the enigmatic nature of life under the sun, because we have gone in search of many schemes. Now, one of those schemes that humanity go in search of is to try and be really good, good enough for God. And I think that's what's going on in verse 16 here, where he says, don't be over-righteous or don't be over-wise. Don't try and be good enough for God. So that's there in verse 16, and that's what's fleshed out in verses 19 to 24, uh, where we see he shows how wisdom is a really good thing, but straight away he goes, but there's no one on earth who's righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. And he's showing us that actually it's impossible for us to be good enough or wise enough for God. He says, all this I tested with wisdom, but he says, this was beyond me. He, he couldn't be wise enough or good enough. And I take it that's what verse 16 and is fleshed out in these verses are telling us. You can't be good enough for God. But on the other side of this, don't live like a fool. And I think that's what he's talking about in verse 17, which is fleshed out in verses 25 to 28. Uh, he's saying... Uh, don't be over wicked. Don't be a fool. So on the one hand, you can't be good enough for God. But on the other hand, don't live like a fool. And here we see where he speaks about the woman here. He's not talking about a woman in general. I think to better understand this, uh, we need to understand that this is the, temp the temptress of Proverbs. If you go and read uh, Proverbs chapters 1 through to chapter 9, uh, you'll see uh, that folly is often spoken of as she's personified as this woman who leads people astray. And I think this is the woman that he's talking about. And you, you can see the same type of words that are used in Proverbs. She's a trap, a snare, chains. Um, she will ensnare you and lead you to death is what he's saying ultimately here. Where on the other hand, this upright woman, that's uh, wisdom personified, he's saying he hasn't found wisdom. So he easily found uh, folly. Folly is just everywhere. And if we look at our world, we see it's very easy to be a fool, uh, but very few are wise, truly wise. And, and that's what he's uh, talking about here. But he's, he says, you can't be good enough for God. Don't even try. But on the other hand, don't live like a fool. That's where verse 18 comes in. It's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. So grasp this truth that you can't be good enough for God, but also grasp this truth that you mustn't live like a fool because living like a fool will kill you. It leads you to death. Why die before your time? And then he says, whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. So you avoid the extreme of trying to be good enough for God, but also avoid the extreme of just being a wicked fool and living life as you choose. Now, the big problem with all of this is this chapter left by itself doesn't leave us with much hope. But we aren't reading this passage as Old Testament Christians. Uh, yeah, the original audience uh, were the people in Mr. Teacher's Day. Uh, we need to kind of do the hard work of exegesis, 
thinking about what this text meant for them then. But then we also want to do um, theological reflection, thinking about what difference does the cross of Christ make to this truth that we see here. So we need to do this hard work of working out uh, what the text meant uh, to them then, doing this theological reflection, thinking what difference does the cross of Jesus make to this before we actually uh, arrive at what this text means for us today. And the very interesting thing that we see in this section is verse 20 here, is the only verse in the whole of Ecclesiastes that is quoted in the New Testament. And if you go and look at uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, 10 to 12, uh, we see that uh, this verse is quoted where Paul is, is building this case of the universal sinfulness of humanity. And he, he just builds on this fact that there is no one righteous. But thankfully, Romans 3 continues and we get to verse 21 to 24 where we see that justification is possible. Uh, we can be counted as righteous because Jesus came to die for our foolish wickedness. He came because we couldn't be good enough for God. And he came to die the death we deserve to die. And for those who fear God rightly, who trust in Jesus, uh, we are seen as righteous. Righteous in Jesus. His righteousness is counted to us. And so in this enigmatic life under the sun where things don't always make sense, what we see as those who are this side of the cross is that Jesus came because he knew that people couldn't be good enough for God. He knew that wicked fools needed to be saved and Jesus is the only one who can save us. Now the big challenge for us though is that uh, we continue to go in search of many schemes. Even as Christians, we sometimes fall into the danger of trying to be good enough for God, and we can't. So we need to rest on God's grace. And in the same way, we mustn't then rest in God's grace to such a degree that we just carry on living as fools, trusting that God's grace will save us. No, the grace of God should transform us so that we increasingly live in the likeness of Christ. And so as we reflect on Jesus who came uh, to a world full of unrighteous fools, that he came to save us by his amazing grace, we don't try to be good enough for God. We rest in that grace. We don't continue to live as wicked fools. We rest in his grace, which transforms us. And we want the world around us to know this Jesus who came to a people who had gone in search of many schemes walking away from God, the glorious truth is that God in Christ came to find us, to search for us, and to save us. And so there's wonderful hope held out to us in this important passage. And as you dig into this passage further and reflect further on this, I pray that it would thrill your heart to see what God has done for us in Christ. Well, God bless as you dig in further.